When you're making your peanut butter sandwich, do you ever have the thought that this could make you sick or even kill you? If you live in any developed nation, I'm guessing this isn't an intrusive thought you have very often, but peanut butter can be deadly and food can kill. And one of the only safeguards against this is whatever food laws and regulation govern your country. If you don't believe me, here's four true stories that illustrate just how important food law is and also explain some pretty interesting wider phenomenons like why you've probably never tried an Austrian wine and why Chinese parents will pay a premium to get imported baby food. When you think of world-class wines, what countries come to mind? For me, it's probably France and Spain and maybe Italy. But how far down on your list do you have to go until you think Austria? For me, I don't know if that would ever make my list. That's because the reputation of the Austrian wine industry was absolutely shattered due to the glyco wine scandal of 1985. Let me set the scene. It's the early 1980s and the Austrian winemakers have found themselves in a bit of a pickle. The past several years have been terrible for growing grapes, and the few grapes they do have are very sour and acidic, not the ripe, super sweet grapes they need to make their agreed upon quota that they have with West Germany's liquor stores and supermarkets. Instead of fessing up, the winemakers come up with a little trick to cover up the low quality of the wine. They begin adding ethylene glycol to the sour wine. Now you might ask, why not just add sugar if they needed to up the sweetness? Well, that would have been a safer option, but ethylene glycol was used for two reasons. The first being it was sweet, so it corrected the sour grapes for sweetness, but secondly, it also added viscosity. It made the wine have a fuller body, have the right mouthfeel when it would be drank. And this ploy, it worked for several years throughout the entire early 1980s until the fateful day of June 27, 1985. With recent advances in wine testing technology, the Germans discovered that one bottle of Austrian wine was adulterated with the chemical ethylene glycol. But then they tested additional bottles of Austrian wine and they also had the chemical and more and more until they basically found out that all the wine imported from Austria did contain ethylene glycol. And this was a huge deal. Not only was it a lie to cover up the crappy quality of the Austrian wine, in humans, ethylene glycol is known for causing organ dysfunction, particularly renal failure, and can even be fatal. Well, there are zero deaths associated with the wine glycol scandal, which you'll see in my other examples, that is actually something to be very, very thankful for. This is simply because ethylene glycol, it was diluted in the rest of the wine. So if it was served like straight up, that could kill a human, but luckily it was diluted to low enough amounts that no one died from drinking the wine. Although if you know anything about toxins, it's also not good to be exposed to small amounts of toxins over a long period of time. That's the definition of chronic toxicity. And remember, this scandal went on for years before being detected. As you might expect, this absolutely obliterated the reputation of all Austrian wines, every single one. Countries were banning the import of Austrian wines. They said, we don't want any of this. I will say after the scandal, the Austrian government moved very quickly to write up new stricter regulations of the wine industry, basically made it way harder for this type of malpractice to ever happen again. And they actually started the wine classification system in Austria that is still used today. You've probably heard about Watergate and maybe you even remember Deflategate, but what about Tunagate? This is a 1985 Canadian political scandal where one minister decided to sell tainted tuna to the public even though it already had been deemed unfit for human consumption. So how could this happen? Enter the tuna canning factory in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, where food inspectors were increasingly saying the tuna was rancid, 
spoiled, it literally smelled bad and would turn your stomach. They started deeming more and more cans unfit for human consumption. All this unsold product, this tuna, starts piling up in warehouses, right? And they can't sell it to make money. Eventually there's so much unsold tuna that the issue catches the eye of the head of state of New Brunswick and he wants to help the company out because he doesn't want to lose the hundreds of jobs that the company has in his region and he doesn't want them to lose any face or reputation for having this spoiled tuna. The head of state calls on his friend, his buddy, John Fraser, who is actually the fisheries minister in the national government. He pleads with Fraser to help pressure someone or something so that he can sell this tuna even though it was deemed unfit for human consumption. And Fraser, he goes, no worries, I got you, I got you, my dude. I'm gonna hire my own independent panel and have them taste this, this product that the inspectors say can't be sold. So he does this, and guess what his independent panel says? His independent panel also says, yeah, this is spoiled, this is tainted tuna, 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 hmm. You can't sell this to consumers. But Fraser doesn't care what his independent panel said. He doesn't care what the food inspector said and he overturns the ruling that this tuna is unfit for human consumption and says, get it out, get it on the grocery store shelves now. So this disgusting tuna is sold to the public until one night Canadians sit down to watch TV. A program called The Fifth Estate airs a story about how spoiled tuna, which has been declared not for human consumption, is being sold. And public outcry ensues. Within a matter of days, Minister Fraser has to recall the one million cans of spoiled tuna anyways. Well, you may want to think of Minister Fraser as being, you know, motivated. Maybe he wanted to keep those 400 jobs at the tuna canning facility. He didn't want the company's name to be tarnished or the tuna industry of Canada be tarnished. Well, all that happened, and he most likely made the decisions he did because of the money. Two days after the recall, Fraser was forced to resign from his duties, and the Canadian government would go on to amend food laws so that government personnel couldn't simply reverse the decision of food inspectors. We have to talk about number two, the American peanut poisoning. One, because it was on my home turf, and two, because it resulted in the largest food recall in American history. This is a very tragic tale where nine people were killed, 166 others were hospitalized, and it's estimated that anywhere between 11,000 to 20,000 Americans were made sick. And this is not only a great example of why we need food regulation because people died, but also because it spurred the passage of the Food Safety and Modernization Act of 2011, which updated food laws, food safety laws in the U.S. that had not been updated for over 70 years. And I think a lot had changed in the past 70 years. And what makes this story even more unbelievable is that this huge health crisis in the U.S. was caused by one very tiny peanut processor. This story begins in 2008 when the Center for Disease Control noticed that there's a multi-state outbreak of salmonella. The first three people to die from this outbreak all lived in the same nursing home and investigators figured out they all had eaten peanut butter out of this big institutional sized tub that had been supplied to the retirement home. This peanut butter was traced back to a manufacturing plant in Blakely, Georgia that was owned by the Peanut Corporation of America. I'll just call them PCA for short. With further inspection, it was revealed that PCA, some of their executives had knowingly sent out and sold peanut butter that had tested positive for salmonella that was contaminated. And not only in that year, 2008, but they also did this the previous year. Here's one email from PCA's national sales manager and he's referring to like big totes of peanut meal in, in their factory. They need to air hose the top off though because they're covered in dust and rat crap. This email was then forwarded to the CEO of PCA, Stuart Parnell, and Parnell, he responds, clean them all up and ship them out. 
There's also another email where the CEO is responding to all the positive tests that his products are getting for Salmonella. And here's what he says about it. Costing us huge dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, money, money, money. And there is a long list of bad practices that PCA normalized and routinely did. If the company received a positive salmonella test, they would resend the sample back out until they got a negative test. Well, this is terrible food safety practice and basically it's an unwritten rule that you can't disregard that positive result. It wasn't illegal at the time to just keep testing and testing until you got the results you wanted. PCA also did not regularly swab the facility or any of the equipment to test for the presence of any pathogens. They only tested their final samples when a customer required it, otherwise no testing. Now I know you would hope that food inspectors from the FDA, you would say, well, don't they tour these facilities, these food manufacturing facilities? And yes, they are supposed to regularly do this to make sure our food is being made in a sanitary way. Unfortunately, at the time, the FDA was partnering with the state of Georgia, which allowed the state to inspect their own food manufacturing facilities. Only problem was, the health inspectors of Georgia were so underfunded and understaffed that at the time of this outbreak, most food facilities had not been inspected in five or more years. When the CDC finally visited the peanut processing plant in Georgia, it was a nightmare. Here is how a place where food is manufactured, food that Americans ate, here is where it was produced. There were filthy surfaces, standing water, which standing water is bad because it can usually grow bacteria, openings in the walls, roofs, and doorways, large enough for vermin and birds to enter. There were bird feathers, insects, contaminants around the building. This is an absolute disaster for a place that makes something that Americans put in their body. And within this disgusting facility, not only was peanut butter made, but also peanut paste, which is an, an ingredient for a whole slew of food products like cookies, cakes, ice cream, crackers. And this is why the food outbreak became so big, is that in the end, over 361 customers were sold this tainted, the salmonella filled peanut ingredients which means that over 3,918 products had to be recalled. In the end, the CEO of PCA received a sentence of 28 years in prison. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of those loopholes or those unwritten rules that PCA used to their advantage, most of this was updated by the Food Safety and Modernization Act, which was passed in 2011. Number one on my list of why exactly we need food regulation, this is the Chinese milk outrage of 2008. And I just want to say there's a reason this is number one, and that's because it involves the most vulnerable consumers, and that's babies. So just a heads up, this isn't a story with a very happy ending, and it does involve very small children. Just to make matters worse, this event was done 100% intentionally and was absolutely, positively, 100% avoidable. This scandal begins in 2008 when Chinese doctors are noticing that more and more infants are being hospitalized for kidney stones and renal failure. Quite an odd thing, as more babies continue to get sick with these exact same symptoms, investigators are brought in to see what's the connection between all these children and they find out that in every case, the infants had all eaten baby formula made by the dairy company San Lu. When the infant formula in question was tested, it was found to contain an industrial chemical called melamine. And this was not a random chemical. Melamine was added for a very specific reason. Like milk proteins, melamine is very high in nitrogen. And this is important because what was happening behind closed doors is farmers were taking their raw milk and they were diluting it with water to make it look like they had more milk to sell so they'd make more money. But just in case the authorities tested their milk to see if the protein content was at the level it should be for regular milk, they had to add in melamine to their diluted milk to make it appear like the protein content was cracked so that things would be sold as usual. No one would get caught. Things do get worse from here, believe it or not. 
because it's not just the infant formula that was contaminated with the melamine. The babies are just the first to show the side effects of ingesting melamine because their body is developing and growing at such a fast rate. It's virtually all the Chinese dairy products. It's the milk, it's the ice cream, it's the yogurt, it's everything. And it's not, not just that Sanlu brand, it's all other Chinese brands as well. It's just the whole system is rotten. It's everything. In the end, six infants died from this tainted infant formula. Another 52,000 infants were hospitalized and an estimated 250,000 infants suffered from mild kidney and urinary problems. And this disaster completely overhauled food regulation in China, and obviously for good reason. In 2009, so just one year after this tragic story, the Chinese government updated food laws that contained 104 new rules in 10 different chapters, and this emphasized things like regular inspections and the introduction of a food recall system. If you enjoyed this video, you have to check out my two-part series about true food crime where I explain how foods like cakes, spices, and milk get involved in food fraud.